Join me in welcoming Beth Linker from the Department of History and Sociology of Science. Hi, everybody. Beth and I are going to I am not a robot. <laughs> At least I don't think so. All right. As far as you know, I'm not. <laughs> We're going to have a short conversation here about some of the themes in the film, in part gesturing towards the, sort of the larger theme that we've been talking about this week for the film festival on Almost Human, but also asking some things specific to this particular film. I actually want to start, Beth, by asking you a question. It's a variation on a theme of a question we've been starting almost every night, asking some of these proto-human characters, are they really human? I want to ask you that about Ava, but I want to also ask you maybe even the more pointed question, how much is Ava actually a woman, not just a human? Yeah, that's the interesting question. I mean, the whole premise of this movie is based on the Turing test, which um, it, the, the film goes through it kind of fast. Turing was um, a mathematician, British mathematician, um, cryptographer, um, helped win World War II by decoding. If any of you saw the imitation game, that, that's Turing. Um, and his test actually is supposed to be, there's supposed to be two rooms. One is a computer in one room and the human in the other room and the interrogator is outside. And you're only supposed to communicate by text communication. So even the interrogator can't even hear vocalizations. And you hear in this movie that, you know, like the, the, the creator, uh, Nathan's like, we're gonna go, you know, that's not a real test, uh, you know, to, 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 for intelligence. Um, and so he dismisses with that, and Caleb is face to face with Ava. Um, and it is, you know, I heard the director, I read an interview in preparation for this with a director, and he says, you know, oh, Ava, she's genderless. She's essentially genderless. And when I think of this movie and I see it again, I think actually quite the opposite. You know, it is, she is highly sexualized in a kind of very uh, prototypical feminine way. I mean, the way that she manipulates the situation is not through like pure intelligence. I mean, she could have shut that place down yeah, yeah. like way before, like just beyond just the power outages. It's to kind of seduce, you know, she wears these flirty girly mm -hmm. dresses. Yeah. We learn that she's anatomically able mm -hmm. uh, to have pleasure and to, and to be sexually active. And the, you know, Nathan is, creates her, you assume, for that, like yeah. a sex toy. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting when I think of the theme of human, I'm like, well, okay, intelligence, so first the Turing test is to, 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 to see if she's human, but your question's a good one because, I mean, if, if, you, if we imagine like having the Turing test be successful, why would the computer need to be gendered? Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that is exactly what has to happen. And this yeah. is kind of something that the film brings up. It's an interesting reflection on the way that the movie, and if there was criticism of the movie, the movie had almost universal acclaim when it came out, but some of the criticism were things like, wow, it really resorts to kind of a slasher in the last eight minutes. Um, I would say one of the criticisms I have is that very complicated relationship it has with gender, even how she gets constructed at the end. I mean, what makes her a woman? Is it that she has flesh? Is it that she has a vagina? Stilettos. Stilettos. <laughs> I saw those heels and I was like, wow, this is a very specific <coughs> kind portrait. of female. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And in some ways then, if the director said she's genderless, one could also say if a, if a critique of the film was that it's super smart and at the end it gets almost, it becomes a horror film. I was very struck at the end, by the way, with the bodies in the hallway like how much this movie actually has in common with like The Shining, which is mm -hmm. to say, you know, very few people in a very large space with dead bodies. I didn't even notice till the end when the corpses were on the ground. But Ava also in some ways is just, she's just a femme fatale. Yes, you know? yeah, and I don't think, so I think, you know, in, in, and, but likewise, <clears throat> Nathan is um, the creator is, you know, you know, maybe the director kind of sees that as like IT as totally the, the macho, um, extreme, you know, the first scene where we meet of him, he's boxing and he's not even boxing with yeah. gloves on. He's, you know, like yeah. just his bare hands and he kind of represents the ultimate of machoism. Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting in the sense that in a, in a not very populated film, we get a really wide spectrum of what typical male and typical female sort of looks like. Let me ask you a bit more about Nathan. He has obviously predecessors in Frankenstein in The Island of Dr. Moreau, another example of a sort of mad scientist stranded off in some exotic locale constructing and forming new forms of life. Um, I want to ask you kind of a simple question. Is Nathan creepy? Because, um, no, on, on the one hand, just to give you some examples, 
If you've ever heard, heard the 80s film Weird Science, it's about these nerdy kids who construct a fake female, and it's supposed to be the high school pubescent guy's ideal fantasy to create this beautiful woman who basically just wants to have sex with you. The running riff in the movie is that the guys are too scared to. But So in some ways, it's the ideal fantasy to think of this robotic or proto-human sort of sex woman. On the other hand, is it like the sex you know, sort of doll sort of thing? I'm reminded watching this of something like Jeffrey Dahmer. If you remember Jeffrey Dahmer, serial killer, his motivation was to turn men into sex zombies. So one of the things I want to ask you is, is Nathan on the register of fulfilling a male fantasy or playing into a creepy, sadistic, sexual sort of fantasy? Where does he lie? Well, I wouldn't want to be hanging out with him. <laughs> I mean, I find him, I wouldn't want to spend more than two minutes with him, you know, but that's me as a, as a, um, I think, I think what he represents again, and, um, I think he represents the, again, perhaps the director has some kind of notion, like, you know, the fear, right? The fear that machines that, first of all, machines will take over and that we might not even recognize who's machine and who's not. Um, that machine person, uh, that, the unsettlingness that that leaves us with. And he, you know, and he's very cavalier about it, or, I mean, not cavalier, in the one scene he's like, no, you, dude, you don't need to worry about Ava, you need to think about us. Like, you know, the AIs are gonna take over the world. But he's very nonchalant about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, so I guess I would say he is creepy, and then this, the, the, the question is what makes him creepy? And maybe what makes him creepy is his unfeeling, you know, like he seems rather unfeeling. Like we're supposed to be drawn in by Ava that she's kind of, you know, innocent and cute, and mm -hmm. um, she might be following in, falling in love, although later on we learned that that's not really true. She couldn't give a shit about Caleb. Um, and so what's creepy, it seems, about Nathan is that he seems unfeeling. He seems like a social outcast, which yeah. is our kind of how we think of like really smart, brilliant people who invent things, right? They don't really know how to relate to anybody. So he's in that compound by himself, surrounded by robots. Yeah. And has no human interaction. 